And now recognizes Mr. Ajit Sahi. Five minutes for your summary. Uh, Honorable Chairman and Congressman Franks, thank you so much for inviting me here. I come from India, and as you've read my, uh, my brief profile, much of the things that I have to say in my oral testimony, of course, is covered by, has been covered by my co-panelist, Mr. Sifton. Two things are very important uh, to know about the current status of human rights in India. One is, why is it happening? And two is, where do we see it going from here? The first part, Mr. Sifton, uh, towards the end of his oral testimony, he hinted at it, and he said we should recognize that Mr. Modi's BJP party is an actor. I would like to make a small amend to that, and I would say it is the director and not just the actor. It is the producer of human rights violations in India. It is the director of human rights violations in India because it springs from an organization which is fundamentally a racist a human rights, a, an organization that has indulged in human rights abuses and violence for nearly 90 years. This is an organization which is known better uh, by its acronym called RSS, which is a self-avowed, self-confessed Hindu supremacist organization. And the BJP is a political wing of that organization. And the Mr. Modi is not only the best known leader of that organization, he is also the Prime Minister of India, coming from the BJP, which is the political heir, the political wing of the RSS, which part of its, part of its documentation, part of its core principles is to turn India into a Hindu nation where non-Hindus, who are about 20% of India's population of 1.3 billion, the non-Hindus, such as Muslims and Christians, as well as uh, Sikhs, they do not have any rights or they have far fewer civil and political rights than Hindus have. That is a stated goal of the RSS and that is how it has been since 1925 when this organization was set up. This organization was one of the people who was the main assassin of Mahatma Gandhi in 1948. There has been lingering doubts about his involvement with this organization. Even though this organization has consistently denied it, the fact is that he worked very closely with members of this organization back in the 1930s and the 40s before he went on to assassinate Mahatma Gandhi, who upheld the principles of secularism and India being a diverse con a country, as uh, Congressman uh, Trent Franks noted. I want to talk about the fact that what has been happening with the rise of Mr. Modi's government is that these, the hate-filled and bigoted ideology of the RSS has become one of the big motivations behind the widespread human rights violations across India especially since he became prime minister. So we need to understand why this is happening. It is not as if this is happening, uh, this is being done externally by some other people. It is being carried out by people who are connected with the government of the day and therefore who will have the courage or the conviction of that courage to carry out any kind of uh, counter, you know, uh, pr presenting a counter to such activities. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, talked about the Dalits. I'm very glad that you have talked about the Dalits. You see, the ideology of Hindu supremacism is not limited to abusing India's religious minorities. Indeed, the rigidly hierarchical caste system of the Hindu society has for centuries discriminated against those lower down its chain to such an extent that they have been the infamous untouchables of the Indian society. And then we need to add to this list India's 15% tribal people who have traditionally inhabited vast for forested stretches, millions of who have been forcefully dispossessed of their lands and homes over decades to make way for industrial projects, as you noted just now yourself. And that is why, as a result, thousands of them have been fighting back in my view, in the view of many of us, in a misplaced fight back. But nonetheless, there is an armed insurgency raging through the central Indian forests today as we speak here. And as a result, what has happened is that paramilitaries are now the only government across much of central India where such insur insurgency has caught momentum in the last 15 years. And this has led inevitably to massive human rights abuses by local police and the paramilitaries because they target innocent people, the innocent citizens of India, and put them in prison on false and f charges and fabricated evidence. This is something, as you noted, Chairman, Honorable Chairman, uh, I have covered in my journalism 
through the years. We've seen, I don't want to talk much about uh, the state of Jammu Kashmir, which is a d northern Indian state disputed by Pakistan since 1947 when the two countries split uh, from British India. And they, were, they gained their independence. But the fact that since 1989, especially since 1989, the Indian Army has had a very strong presence in the state of Jammu Kashmir. Thousands and thousands of people have, are said to have died. They are, they are said to have suffered huge, massive human rights abuses at the hands of the Indian Army, which have been documented. They have been, uh, you talked about the northeastern states of India. There has, uh, there's a law since 1958 on the statute of the Indian Constitution, the same Indian Constitution that guarantees equality before law, that there's been a statute in the Indian Constitution which says that armed forces have special powers over certain regions of the country. And for the last 50 years, under those special powers, they have had complete and total impunity from all the crimes that they have committed against the local people there. Just two days ago, and I have I mentioned that in my written test, testimony just two days ago, the, the current uh, ch uh, chief of the army's eastern command wing, which is under which that region comes, he clearly said there is no problem. There is no problem with that Arms Forces, Forces Special Power Act. It's all fine. Whereas the Supreme Court of India, in its own judgments, and commissions headed by the Supreme Court judges have time and again said that this is a completely ridiculous law. It has caused the violations of human rights on an industrial scale, and they should be done away with. I just want to, uh, to talk very, very briefly about the commonest forms of human rights abuses and violations of civil liberties. Which, uh, how do they manifest? One of the forms is extrajudicial killing. It might really come as a surprise to this commission that on an average six people a day are killed in extrajudicial manners in India, in prisons, or in the custody of the police. More than six people a day, an average that has only increased over the last 15 to 20 years, went towards the turn of the century, this average used to be about four a day. And that is what has been increasing. Across India, well over a thousand people die every year in the custody of police or in prison. Another way of putting them away has come to be known as quote-unquote, encounter killing, whereby the police claim they shot the victim dead in self-defense after the latter had attacked them. Even this practice, the Supreme Court has come down very heavily against this. And we talked about, uh, Congressman Trent Franks talked about the situation in Mr. Modi's Gujarat state where he was the chief minister. This practice of encounter killings was a real menace in that area, in that state, until the, the bunch of police officers who were responsible for the succession of such killings were caught, they were apprehended, they were accused. And I just want to complete now one of the, just one last point I want to make, Congressman, is that a lot of innocent human beings, citizens of India, Muslims as well as Dalits and tribals are accused falsely of terror cases, of sedition charges. They're put away in prison and they are freed. They are acquitted of those charges, but only after they have spent 10 or 20 or some, in some cases, even 25 years in prison without once being bailed. So this is a very serious situation. I think it is important to know the very last point, one year from now, I'm really worried that there are elections in India's largest state, a state known as Uttar Pradesh, which has about 200 million people as its population, 200 million. That's almost two-thirds the entire population of the United States. This is a state where there was major sectarian violence with very well-documented involvement of the BJP's people back in 2013, just before Mr. Modi became prime minister. And there is a big fear that ahead of those state legislative elections, there might be attempts by such people to revive those kinds of hatred and bigotry and be apprehend that there might be violence again in that state. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.